Okay, well, thank you all for attending. Uh, it is my honor to be able to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Mr. Khaled Fala. The keynote speaker series is a signature event of the Winter Enrichment Program, and the choice of the opening speaker is not a casual one. I often find it quite humbling to prepare these types of introductions, as the people I talk about are a constant reminder of how much can be done if one makes a commitment to make a difference. And Mr. Fala is certainly no exception. Mr. Fala is a visionary leader and innovator who has re repeatedly been recognized for his efforts. Most notably, he received the King Abdul Aziz Order of the Excellent Class in 2009 and an honorary doctorate from the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology in 2011. Given that he and I both have roots that go back to Texas A&M University, I must also note that he is one of only three Texas A&M graduates to have received both the Distinguished Alumnus Award and the Outstanding International Alumnus Award. He is also the only individual amongst all of those individuals who have graduated since 1980 to have been recognized as a, as a Distinguished Alumnus. And when you consider the fact that the annual enrollment at Texas A&M is 50,000 students, if you calculate back to 1980, that's a remarkable accomplished accomplishment to be the only individual to have been recognized. Mr. Fala has held many roles within Saudi Aramco, including President of Petron Corporation, Senior Vice President for Gas Operations, Executive Vice President for Operations, all before assuming the role of President and Chief Operating Officer in 2009. He has also been involved in some of the company's most significant changes and challenges. He was the first head of the Saudi Aramco New Business Development Organization and guided the development of the kingdom's first nat natural gas strategy. Mr. Fala is currently leading the company in a transition to firmly establish Aramco as the world's leading energy company. Closer to home, Mr. Fala has been a leading voice in the development of KAUST. He has served on the Board of Trustees since its inception and has actively pursued opportunities to promote university corporate interactions. While KAUST may be his most visible effort in giving back to the kingdom, he is also actively involved in the King Abdulaziz Center for World Culture, the Dammam City Municipal Council, the Technical and Vocational Training Corporation, the Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz Fund for supporting small business projects for women, and the Eastern Province Society for the Handicapped. Many people talk the talk of giving back to society, but Mr. Fala is clearly one who also walks the walk. So please help me in welcoming Colonel Fala to the podium. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Ladies and gentlemen, faculty, students, staff, and I saw some families, I even saw some infants uh, in the reception outside. So to all of you, a very good evening. And I, oh, here is the infant, <laughs> proving that I am correct. I was going to say the challenge for me is if I can finish my remarks before hearing the infants, and I think I've already failed. Uh, Another challenge I have for myself is to prove I am more handsome than the photograph they selected for my poster, which I don't think is a very difficult challenge, uh, Jim. Uh, but it's really uh, uh, wonderful to be uh, at my second home here uh, at Kaust. Uh, I've never been in any of these lectures, uh, regrettably. Uh, this is the fifth series of the winter enrichment program. I've heard a lot about them. I think it's a great idea to have a program that is not for credit. It gives the whole community of KAUST and stakeholders in KAUST, and I'm certainly one of them, an opportunity to come and learn about each other, to enrich themselves, and really to practice a principle that I've always advocated, which is learning uh, for the sake of learning's sake. Uh, and I don't know uh, any other institution here uh, in this region that holds uh, an event like this. So I want to acknowledge uh, the leadership at KAUST for the inception of this idea. 
I want to recognize and appreciate uh, uh, Jim Calvin, Professor Calvin, uh, Professor Bill Roberts, uh, the people who uh, organize it, especially this session, Mary Lour uh, and her team for uh, putting together the rich program that we saw just a glimpse of in the introduction by uh, Professor Roberts. Uh, I want to talk, and I, I, I really was at a loss when I was asked to come and speak to you all because there are serious issues that we uh, need to talk about, but then there are issues that are not so serious, but they're also important to me. The serious issue that I hopefully will be able to touch on uh, today and hopefully trigger some uh, discussion and debate uh, within the time allotted this evening is the role of science, technology, and innovation in addressing challenges and opportunities that we're all facing on three dimensions. One is the global dimension. Two is being here in Saudi Arabia, even if you're not Saudi, at the kingdom dimension, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And most closer to me is at the dimension of Saudi Aramco, uh, the company that I have worked for all of my life and currently lead. I also want to address being here at KAUST and also given the central role that this institution plays, the indispensable role that KAUST uh, will play as a powerful engine of science, technology, and innovation in addressing these challenges uh, that I will outline. But first, and this is the not so serious part, yet I think it's very important. I want to, uh, before I get into the substance of the talk, to also personalize uh, my talk to you this evening uh, and talk about the personal side of my relationship uh, with the institution. And uh, Professor Calvin, in introducing the Winter Enrichment Program, he referred to making unusual connections among science and technology. This is what was on the website when I looked at it, preparing for my remarks. And that really got me thinking about my own unusual connection to KAUST. And as I mentioned, it is a very personal story, and it's a life-changing story. And I want to share it because I see myself as very much a member of the Kaust family. And after all, what do families do but share their experiences, concerns, hopes, and dreams? And my story began eight years ago, 8,000 miles from here, with a phone call talking about a fax. You may not use faxes anymore, but we used them back then a lot. And I was at Palo Alto, California at that time, getting my son, who had been enrolled at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, moved from Stanford, where he was taking a summer preparatory program, to Boston. So I was there for a week, getting him ready, uh, prepared when my phone rang at night. It was morning time in Dahran, and who's on the phone? A good dear friend, uh, Nadmi and Nasser. Back then, I was heading an organization within Saudi Aramco called Industrial Relations, and he was leading Saudi Aramco's engineering services. And before he said hello or anything, he said, Khalid, guess what? I said, what? Don't spoil my vacation. <laughs> And he said, I just came to the office, and there is a fax that has just been referred to me by the office of the CEO that is communicating a directive 
from the king through the minister, His Excellency Ali Naimi, who is currently the chairman of the board of trustees of KAUST, basically directing that the company build a flagship research university that will transform higher education and research within the kingdom. So uh, obviously I told him he was kidding and this is no time for jokes. He said, no, I am serious. And then when I thought about it a little bit, it really dawned on me that this is very appropriate on uh, a number of fronts. Uh, first of all, the need was there. Two, it is not unusual for Saudi Aramco to be charged with flagship projects for the kingdom. We're 80 years old as a company, by the way, this year, or actually last year, 2013. And since the beginning, with the kingdom as a nation is only a couple of years older than us. And since the beginning of the kingdom, we have been a partner in development and prosperity for the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Our role transcends that of oil production. We have been part of building all of the projects that matter, from the first schools, first hospitals, first cities, uh, first railway, first airports, first ports, uh, and continued to participate in development in the kingdom in a very, very broad way, in addition to our role in developing the human resources and the human capital of the kingdom, both through development of Aramco employees and partnering with external uh, organizations. And of course, around the world, once this became known and the message was sent that that we were soliciting consultants and contracts and getting prepared to do it, people were really, really uh, surprised uh, about this unusual step of an oil company uh, building uh, a research uh, university that is going to establish the new benchmarks for higher education. And one attribute of Saudi Aramco, in addition to partnering with the kingdom, is the fact that we have built the world's largest oil and gas projects. When you think of a company that leads the industry by a factor of two, in terms of the separation between us as the global leader and second tier companies behind us, that means we have built massive projects. And we have typically done it to excellent standards, and we have done it uh, in record uh, time, whether they're uh, production facilities for oil, gas, refineries, recently petrochemical plants, ports uh, that, that, that are used to export uh, oil and gas. But it surely dawned on me that what we're about to do here is no ordinary project. This is not just about bricks and mortar. For one thing, the king didn't want just any university. The king really wanted a transformative institution that would, as I mentioned earlier, set uh, the benchmark. What also uh, daunted on me is the fact that he wanted it in three years. From inception, a very sketchy conceptual idea of what we had to do, to starting schools, starting research, starting global collaboration, and starting to have massive impact uh, within the kingdom uh, and around the world. We had 1,000 days to design and build a major research university, as I mentioned, from scratch. The facilities involved, and now you see them around you, I don't have to describe it to this audience. But you have to remember what we had to start with. This was sabha. These were salt flats that you couldn't even walk over. Four-wheel trucks got sunk as we tried to do soil uh, inspection. It took us a year just to do soil remediation using stone columns and other engineering solutions in order to be able to build buildings on top of this. Uh, of, of this. And we had to have it all self 
uh, sufficient. So it wasn't just about the campus and all of the sophisticated laboratories that you uh, work around and some of you work. Uh, and then this was also about a community, about the utilities, about all of the amenities in life so people don't have to travel back and forth to Jeddah and so forth. And indeed, on a fast-track basis, we built the world's best laboratories, installed one of the world's most powerful supercomputers, and put both campus and community in place to serve the university's researchers and students. And we worked to develop the local infrastructure here in Thuwal through a number of initiatives, and I'm sure you have seen some of them in town. And as I increasingly became closely involved with and deeply committed to this institution, I could, see, I could see that this university was not just a construction project, as I mentioned earlier, but a gift. This was the opportunity to build a premier institution, comparable to the world's elite universities, educating leading scientists, undertaking cutting-edge research, producing groundbreaking technologies, and laying the foundation for the kingdom of the future. Time and again, I was struck by this paradox. On the one hand, KAUST is a new institution with a global role, a 21st academic, uh, academic research institution aiming to be the most modern and forward-looking university on Earth. But at the same time, it has deep roots in an earlier era when our region led the way in progress and innovation. Virtually no aspect of science was untouched by the intellectual ferment of the Beit al-Hikmah, the world's first great university, first great house of wisdom established more than a millennium ago. The very names contributing to its legacy still echo down through history. Al-Khawarizmi, the father of algebra. Ibn Hayyan, the father of chemistry. Al-Bayruni, the master of mathematics, astronomy, and physics. Maryam Astrolabi, and other men and women whose quest for innovation and passion for investigation forever changed the world in which they lived. And I'm glad that you have a museum to chronicle the contribution of Muslim scientists of that era. But let me say again that those scientists forever changed the world in which they lived. And that sounds very much like the mission that Kaust, the new house of wisdom, has set for itself. Of course, the issues we confront today are of a different order of magnitude and complexity than those that faced the first house of wisdom a thousand years ago. So let us consider some of these contemporary challenges, first from a global, then a national perspective, and finally the issues and opportunities we're facing at our own company in Saudi Arabia. I have often pondered the world my children and someday my grandchildren will inherit, wondering about the big issues that concern all of us. I ask myself, how can we ensure an adequate quality of life for everyone when the global population reaches 9 billion? How will we meet the world's need for plentiful food and water? And I think you saw in the slide one of the lectures will be addressing that very topic. How will we seize the economic opportunity, the promise and prosperity that come with personal mobility. And of course, I am conscious of the need to ensure sufficient and sustainable supplies of energy for decades to come, even as the world struggles today to overcome significant pockets of energy poverty. This is, of course, a topic near and dear to my heart, being in the energy business. The question is, what would it take to achieve these ambitious goals despite what appears today as overwhelming challenges. Those global issues are mirrored here in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, creating new career opportunities for youth, curbing high energy consumption, protecting the natural environment, and moving away from an economic model 
concentrated on the monetization of an abundant but ultimately finite natural resource, oil. These issues take an added significance when one considers that the kingdom is determined to transition from an energy intensive to a knowledge based economy and in fact seeks to become a knowledge society. So how do we overcome the challenges and reap those promising opportunities? Of course, just as the kingdom is opening a new chapter, so is Saudi Aramco. Today, we are by far, as I mentioned, the top exporter of crude oil and natural gas liquid, and the world's largest oil company based on production, reserves, and refining capacity. But successful organizations must keep pace with change. And with the, with the whole world changing, the global community is calling on leading companies like Saudi Aramco to find solutions to the grand challenges of our time. That imperative has led us to design and deploy Saudi Aramco's accelerated transformation program referred to by Jim in his introduction. The ATP, as we call it, is a top to bottom side-to-side re-examination of the businesses that we run. In other words, our portfolio, but even of the way we conduct business. We are expanding our business portfolio and asset base, re-engineering our processes, and even recalibrating our behaviors, and becoming more engaged in some of the kingdom's most pressing issues, including energy intensity, economic diversification, and the creation of new business opportunities for the private sector. However, all of these efforts, ladies and gentlemen, are ultimately just means to an end. And the true goal of the ATP is the realization of our corporation's fullest potential, our corporation and its people's fullest potential, while enabling the kingdom's development in the broadest of terms. That means developing into a company that will not only change with the global energy landscape, but lead that evolution. So how do we meet these tall objectives? Ladies and gentlemen, these are highly complex, highly significant issues, whether we look at the global level, take a national perspective, or examine just one company and its activities. But the common thread here is unmistakable, impact for research, technology, and talent, which are necessary to spur economic growth and diversification, necessary to create jobs, high quality jobs, and address challenges like energy availability, water quality, and scarcity, and sustainability of resources. Like you, I've always believed that science, technology, and innovation placed in the sure hands of creative human beings like yourselves are the answer to a wide spectrum of the global issues that we face at this point in human history. The same is true for our kingdom, which needs quality education, capacity building, research, technology, and entrepreneurship to achieve even greater prosperity for the people of Saudi Arabia. As the kingdom continues to move toward a knowledge society, I do look forward to a greater depth and breadth of research and development activities from here in the Red Sea to the Arabian Gulf. And without a doubt, Saudi Aramco's accelerated transformation program is built on a firm foundation of science, technology, and applied research. We in Saudi Aramco are determined to be the innovation company of the future. And we are working aggressively to achieve this vision. Turning Saudi Aramco into a world leading creator of energy solutions is a critical goal, not only for our expanding chemical business, which is going to be very highly technology intensive, but for our other businesses as well, including oil and gas and our emerging role in renewables. We are increasing our R&D funding fivefold, and it's already significant. 
and we're tripling our hiring in sciences and technology to further strengthen our existing team of premier scientists. In addition, we are committing hundreds of millions of dollars to establish eight satellite research centers in the United States, Europe, and Asia, including one right here at KAUST. And we recently appointed, for the first time, a world-renowned chemist, Dr. Charles Kresge, as our first ever chief technology officer and we're elevating the scientific career ladder within the company to parallel that of our management ranks. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, it is exciting these days to be at Saudi Aramco. Now, earlier I said that I shared your belief in the transformative power of science, technology, and innovation. But by extension, we also share the belief that this institution, KAUST, holds many of the keys to the most pressing challenges of our age. That role rests on the four thrusts that were selected for KAUST's unique research agenda, which are food, water, energy, and the environment. These areas are in turn brought to life by outstanding professors and researchers capable and committed students, and a visionary leadership team, all of whom have left the comfort of their homes and found their way to KAUST here in Tours. And of course, the world-class facilities and advanced scientific and technical tools on this campus help to turn theory into practice and to translate scientific breakthroughs into effective solutions. Because make no mistake, KAUST is in the business of improving lives every bit as much as it is engaged in scientific discovery and research. But as important as the work being done in the labs and classrooms around, around us, KAUST's true significance can only be measured accurately if we also gauge its influence within the wider academic and research community, both globally and domestically. World, worldwide, I believe that KAUST has been able to inspire the scientific community. Otherwise, how were we able to bring some of the best and brightest to these shores? And many of them are with us this evening. Why are other leading research institutions eager to partner with KAUST? I think everyone is hoping to tap into the unique spirit, the sense of focus, and, and, and purpose, and the mission one finds right here at Coast. You have indeed served as an inspiration to communities across the globe, and the story is certainly no different within the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. When Coast doors opened, the kingdom had seven universities. But encouraged by development here in Thuol, the kingdom today has 24 universities and colleges with hundreds of thousands of additional students enrolled. Many other academic institutions in the kingdom have also started endowment programs which were unknown back in 2006. And alumni clubs feature increasingly international student bodies and are refocusing their efforts in the STEM disciplines. Furthermore, the role of women and education has significantly increased within academic institutions. In other words, the ripple effect from this incredible university is being felt far and wide, and you have indeed stirred the pond. And in fact, one of the events we had in this building last year was uh, a forum uh, brought leading proponents of transformation into a knowledge economy and a knowledge society that could have been held anywhere else, but they elected to have it at KAUST due to the inspirational role that KAUST has initiated in pushing the kingdom forward towards that transformation. And when it comes to Saudi Aramco, your influence has also been profound. In fact, it cannot be overstated. 
clearly KAUST is an important partner in many of our R&D endeavors, and we have many, many projects that we are working jointly with researchers here at KAUST. At the same time, we're bringing some of the world-class talent from this campus into our organization at Saudi Aramco. We have recruited more KAUST graduates than any other entity, and in fact, we now have more than 100 KAUST alumni among our ranks, and I can tell you that we are thrilled with their performance and their qualifications. But once again, this university's impact goes beyond its direct contributions as measured by quality graduates and research outcomes. I'm glad to note that to a large extent, Saudi Aramco's new transformation, and particularly its innovation mindset, was cast right here at KAUST. The ATP that I referred to and was mentioned by Professor Calvin was just an idea back in 2009. But after finishing with the creation of the university, building it and starting the academic life, I started looking at the company and asking some of the tough questions about our potential versus what we have achieved. And I wanted to bring the management team to a place that is inspirational, that can demonstrate the can-do attitude, doing the impossible and turning it into reality. And I couldn't think. We could have gone abroad. We could have gone to Bangalore in India. We could have gone to a number of locations. We could have gone to our own Sheba and had our retreat with the leadership team of Aramco. But I couldn't think of a better place than Kaust. And we came, a whole leadership of Aramco, and spent three full days here in Kaust. You were kind enough to host us. And we had our meetings in the Yacht Club. I think we were the first people to use the Yacht Club back then. In fact, it was still undergoing some uh, little bit of construction while we were there. But it really served as the inspirational location for us to realize what uh, can be done by human beings when they set their mind to something, the opportunities, and it also set in our mind the important role of science, technology, and innovation, and uh, not only leading organizations like Saudi Aramco, but being the engine that will transform the bigger world, not just the company. So my friends, the story of Saudi Aramco's contributions to the establishment of cost has, cost has been often told and is well recognized. But the inspiration and insight that Kaust has given and returned to others, not just Saudi Aramco, should also be acknowledged and celebrated. However, one of the most important aspects of Kaust's influence transcends science, engineering, and R&D. That's because KAUST also served as an example of the power of collaboration across disciplines and institutions and gathers together individuals of diverse backgrounds. So even as KAUST has bridged to an inspirational past and will be a bridge to the future, I believe also that it can bridge human understanding today an element that is essential to the spirit of open collaboration and an open international community that drives innovation here in this institution. The custodian of the two holy mosques intended for Kaust in his own words to bring the world to Saudi Arabia and bring Saudi Arabia to the world. And that is just what's happening. Kaust is indeed provide, proving to be a magnet for many of the world's best minds. That's important because innovation is not just a matter of the most powerful electron microscopes or most sophisticated nanotechnology clean rooms. It's about scientists and researchers collaborating to turn abstract ideas and theory into transformative solutions. And connecting the global village is about more than the internet and social media. It means people of many cultures, nations, and professional disciplines working together, living together, 
and putting their hearts and minds together to contribute to mankind. And this is exactly what's happening here. Ladies and gentlemen, I have talked a good deal about conceptual matters this evening, but I want to close by telling you about a team within Saudi Aramco consisting exclusively of Kaos graduates who bring these theoretical threads together in a concrete way. This team of eight men and women who are now Saudi Aramco employees are all products of this university and are all in their 20s. But they represent a diverse array of scientific disciplines, areas of expertise and nationalities. In fact, none of them are from the same country and they represent four different continents. This group, led by one of your graduates named Pablo Carrasco of Mexico, designed and developed a robot to inspect pipelines and hard to reach operational areas like beams and elevated vessels within our plant. They went from a conceptual whiteboard idea to a fully working prototype in, f in just 14 months. And their prototype was exhibited in the Ebticar exhibit last month. Their new inspection robot will be field tested in Rasta Noor and Yamba within our facilities in the next few weeks. Their invention has already won the Industry Glory Medal of the International Federation of Inventors Association. And I am particularly proud to note that Ruba Bin Yahid, a Saudi female computer scientist, was engaged in developing the software interface for this inspection robot. So here is a team using science and technology to ensure operational excellence, safeguard the environment, and better protect people and facilities. But it's also a group of smart people with a can-do attitude, the same attitude that got us to build this university. Pulling ideas from different disciplines who saw an angle and an opportunity that no one else recognized. They realize that there is an infinite body of knowledge already, and science that is already existing out there, which can be configured, integrated, and adapted in unexpected and valuable ways. And they did it by combining their respective strengths, working as a team, expertise, and insights. And that's not bad for first-year employees in their 20s who have just graduated from a university in a place called Tour. But what they have done really is perhaps a small example. But I believe there are also bigger transformative trends in, in, in the global landscape that can demonstrate how existing pool of science and technology can be applied differently in massively transformative way. One in our industry can think of the unconventional revolution, so to speak, that has generated hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars of economic activity in the United States and has changed the landscape of the energy industry. Uh, this revolution is not built on any fundamental science that has been discovered in the last 20 years. It's really incremental improvements and bringing different existing technologies like fracking and horizontal drilling and cutting costs and working smarter and harder together to create this uh, transformative re revolution within the energy industry. If you can think of within, within smartphones, the iPhone, and what Apple did and what Steve Jobs did, really there is no fundamental scientific breakthrough. It is bringing together ideas that existed and technologies that were already out there and putting them in new products that uh, not only generated trillions of dollars again to all of the stakeholders in, in Apple, but really changed forever the way, uh, the way we live. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope this discussion has given you a fresh perspective on the promise this community represents and the future that lies ahead of you and, and your colleagues. I think that multinational, multidisciplinary Robox team that we spoke about earlier goes some way toward indicating where that future may lie.
They are each individuals, blessed with considerable intellect, insight, passion, and vision. But they are not unique in those gifts. And this evening, as I look across the room, I can look out and see an entire audience of people blessed with those same attributes. So what is it that each of you will invent, contribute, or deliver to change an industry, a scientific discipline, a nation, or even the entire world? The possibilities, ladies and gentlemen, are infinite as long as you believe that you can do the impossible. And never forget that you are part of an institution that was born out of an impossible achievement. The development of a world-class research university in a thousand days. It meant taking one man's bold dream and transforming it into today's reality that will benefit all of humankind. So doing the impossible is an integral part of Kau's DNA, and it should be an integral part of you. Things that are deemed impossible by some can be done if you put your mind to it. If you offer a compelling vision, a strong promise, and a commitment to deliver, you can attract the best, the brightest, and the most capable because they too will embrace the challenge of achieving the impossible. So, ladies and gentlemen, the power of Kaos programs its vibrant culture embodied here in this wonderful web that we are participating in, and its unusual connections goes well beyond its direct impact. Standing before you, I can say with certainty that if KAUST has achieved so much in such a limited period of time, five years, then Saudi Aramco can also do it, the kingdom can do it, and above all, Humanity can do it as well. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your interactions. In a, in a moment, we will raise the light so that we can have a, a question and answer period. But before we do so, I think that I would like to, to thank Khaled because that, I think, was one of the most compelling examples of the need for internationalization and collaboration and its ability not to just create partnerships for the sake of being able to work together, but to provide the technology transfer across disciplines that can take discoveries and turn them into delivery. And I think we have no better partner than Aramco, but I think no other university in the world has a better corporate partner than we do. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. There will be microphones throughout the room for people to ask questions. We'll move over here and sit down and allow uh, Mr. Fala to get comfortable. And then... so, so while we're getting set up, maybe I'll ask the first question. You talked about the diversification of the, of the kingdom's economy. And clearly moving from into further other branches of the energy industry is an obvious step forward. But there are other sectors, whether they be information technology or other regions within the economy. What would you anticipate are the areas where the kingdom is most well prepared to make this next step in economic growth? Well, uh, I think we have to be uh, realistic and realize that it's going to be an evolution rather than an overnight uh, transformation as such. We have to work with our uh, competitive advantage, but also I think we need to try at the same time to start where others have ended. Uh, so one thing we're blessed with is uh, energy, energy in different forms. Obviously, fossil fuels and oil and gas are, are, are the most evident, and they provide us with a huge advantage. But ultimately, solar energy is going to be uh, an advantage uh, for the kingdom. So using these tracks of continuing to build on oil and gas to get into advanced materials, uh, petro petrochemicals, uh, primary petrochemicals is already well established within the kingdom, taking it a step further into knowledge-intensive secondary and tertiary uh, 
products within the value chain of, of the chemical industries and then using the materials that comes out of that, uh, which are going to be provided uh, at a competitive advantage here, to create other high value added products that meet the needs of tomorrow. So I always tell people who are looking at building certain industries, don't mimic what others have done 10 years ago or five years ago. We need to think of what are the products going to be in demand five years from now and design the factories and the technologies and, and, and uh, uh, the incremental improvements so that we have something unique. We have a differentiated a product using a differentiated technology, taking advantage of a competitive uh, variable that we have here. Uh, I believe our people, many people look at Saudi Arabia and say you have a bulging young population and it's, it's, it's an impediment. I think it's a huge advantage if we're able to provide the skills for these emerging sectors within, within our economy. So, what we do at Saudi Aramco is we partner with the vocational schools as well as have our own vocational training. We partner with KAUST. We are like this with KFUPM in terms of helping KFUPM design the curricula that will fit our needs. So industries need to work with uh, human resource development organization, whether they're higher education or vocational schools, to turn this pool of young people within Saudi Arabia as a competitive advantage. Many other nations are actually faced with, with the flip side of the demographic picture of Saudi Arabia, an aging population, no young people to work, not willing to do the vocational jobs. It's quite the opposite here in the kingdom. So we'll take questions in the audience. I've got a hand up over here. Okay, we, we'll do that one back there first, okay. Thanks. Um, thank you for the speech. Uh, you mentioned sustainable and presumably renewable energy as one of the core pursuances that informed the inception of KAUST. So I'm wondering, um, have you, Saudi Aramco as an entity that is um, considered that there might be short-term threats to your core competence as an oil um, uh, uh, primarily petrochemical industry, and if you have, uh, what, you, what are you going to do to um, address the threat that caused might pose to Saudi Aramco? Thanks. Well, I think we, we, uh, when we look long term and we think in terms of, uh, you know, beyond the century, into the next century, we don't see uh, oil and gas being threatened by any renewable source of energy or any major uh, substitute. In mobility, I think electric cars can work, but the source of electricity that is coming through uh, the transmission systems within, within uh, urban areas, we, we feel is going to ultimately be fossil fuels and nuclear, and those will be uh, will face environmental acceptance and social acceptance uh, issues, especially if you consider that coal is the primary contributor to electric uh, generation now and nuclear is challenged. Uh, solar, as I mentioned, uh, is uh, certainly an emerging uh, source of renewables, but I think it's going to grow from a very small base and we believe long, long, long term it is uh, a very viable technology to invest in, but it still cannot be a base source because it's only available during uh, daytime hours. The same thing with wind. You cannot rely on wind, so they're going to be more uh, for, for supporting rather than substituting. Uh, so I think we look at our oil and gas, and we think they're going to be in more and more need going forward rather than less and less need. Having said that, there are plenty of opportunities for us to grow, not to de-risk our exposure to oil and gas, but to grow from oil and gas to a broader energy company. And that's why we're looking with interest 
at the world of renewables. That's why we're looking at petrochemicals. It's not because we're seeing a big threat, but rather because we're seeing a big opportunity. And we were part of the design that looked at cost, and not only did we build it into the design of cows with the roofs covered by, by photovoltaic cells, but one of the biggest research centers we have here is uh, the solar research center. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming and speaking with us today. I particularly enjoyed your discussion of this collaborative team involving multinational um, partners. I work in kindergarten and I see that every day. <laughs> um, but that said, education uh, is the most important thing that Saudi Arabia is grappling with. Uh, and we're here in a very small population working with a very limited uh, number of small children who are the future of Saudi Arabia. Where do you position Saudi Aramco in um, bringing a more Western pedagogy and a more um, inquiry-based uh, and problem-oriented and collaboration-oriented teaching model that's really going to help the country address so many of these challenges and opportunities? Well, I, I, we're uh, great, uh, strong proponents of uh, continuously reforming education. Uh, I wouldn't use your words of just copying the Western model. I think Western models themselves are constantly evolving and, and questioning what is the appropriate way for education. So we have to arrive at the appropriate fit-for-purpose model for our uh, country, for our society that will work with, uh, with our heritage and, and that will uh, instill a love for learning, a love for inquiry within our young people. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, Saudi Aramco has been uh, a big contributor to human resource development. Both, we built the first schools. There are over 120 schools in the Eastern Province, very large schools that are continue, continue to be maintained by Aramco that were built over the years within uh, the cities there. We're now building a number of schools, by the way, in Thur. I think there are a total of seven schools that, that we are building now for the local community. We partnered with the Ministry of Education in creating uh, a company that they are using to outsource support, including development of curricula to, uh, to, to the broader uh, community. I think more importantly for us is we realize we cannot be the Ministry of Education in Saudi Arabia, nor do we want to. Uh, but what we can do is through a light touch, we can create channels using technology and using inspirational programs that complement what the Ministry of Education is doing. Uh, and, and we launched last year, or late in 2012, a program called ITRA Youth. ITRA means enrichment. So very much in the theme of tonight with the Winter Enrichment Program. And ITRA Youth is one of the programs under a bigger social responsibility umbrella or citizenship umbrella of Saudi Aramco. And we aim to reach this decade two million students. And by reaching them, I don't mean sending them an email or getting them exposed to some some material, but actually getting them into uh, hundreds of hours of uh, process, of inquiry, of experimentation, of study. It's all around, a lot of it is around the STEM discipline, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So we bring material, including robotics, including scientific experiments into classrooms, and we do it uh, in collaboration with the Ministry uh, of Education. Uh, and we, we train the trainers. So we have a number of international collaborators, including uh, Berkeley University and, and, and others uh, around the world. It's quite an extensive uh, 
program. But in addition to STEM, we also talk about and develop in them confidence, uh, communication skills, and, and so on and so forth. And we continue to reach them after they go through these interactive, student-centered learning processes that, uh, that, that we manage. And we didn't start in big cities. And we didn't start around Aramco communities. We started last year, after we launched it, all in uh, villages and towns and far, far out areas. And then we're coming to big towns. I think one of the last big towns we came to is Jeddah. But we started in places like Hail, Jezan, and Ghassim, and places like this, because we want to reach uh, people who may not have access to this kind of learning. And we will continue to discover. I think it's a, it's a journey that we're going to be engaged in. This is not just a one-off type of program. But I am a believer that if the kingdom is going to have a sustainable, thriving future, the foundation of this is education. Everything else we do, whether it's the infrastructure we build, the factories that we create, the proper investment we make is important, necessary, but it's not sufficient. The most important thing is education. Yeah. Uh, we just returned from the trip to Aramka, the group from KAUST went then uh, for the entire day. Uh, and I was first time there, and uh, I would say I was impressed uh, so by organization and most of all by the people who are working there. So, and this big work on developing of the uh, so working force uh, for the kingdom is, uh, is very impressive. Uh, Aramco is well known for this work, what it is done for developing the oil-based and uh, energy-based economy. Uh, and uh, when we came there, so actually, so one of the impressive th uh, things what we uh, saw in the country, it is very intensive industrial developments. Uh, so we uh, see construction everywhere. Uh, and I know that there are uh, very impressive uh, so plans of development of the uh, west coast uh, of the country and uh, uh, huge urbanization. Uh, and my question about, so this development uh, for the future, so it is related to uh, new, uh, new generations, and, uh, uh, but this will produce new impact on, in, on the environment. Uh, and uh, so it's not exactly what Aramka is doing, but what do what you think what will be the role of Aramka uh, in saving the environment and uh, properly developing this? Yeah, I, I uh, thank you for this because uh, environmental you know, compliance, as, as many people call it, to us is not enough. Uh, for us, what we aspire to do is really environmental stewardship in, uh, at a very high level. We want not only to have minimal impact in any area we work, but preferably to actually improve the natural ecosystem wherever we go and do business. Uh, and if you go and look to some of the areas where we have done major uh, production and infrastructure projects, you will be impressed by the meticulous planning, study, baseline studies that we do of the environment and how we uh, preserve it uh, long term. And we haven't, and we'd be learning. We have 80 years of history. And I can't say that we have done this from year one or year two. The intent has been there, and I think we're improving uh, with time. The latest example is Manifa project, which is a shallow water transition zone field between the offshore and the onshore and development, developing it. Uh, in, in the conventional way would have had detrimental impact on a very fragile uh, bay called the Manifa Bay where it, it is essential for the marine life there in the Arabian Gulf. And, and we came up with a very innovative but expensive scheme of building drilling islands and keeping the circulation within the bay and building a lot of bridges in this causeway 
to uh, basically preserve the, the, the natural habitat. Here in the Red Sea, it's even more fragile. And every time I fly over the Red Sea, I am I'm just uh, you know, taken away by the views of, of uh, the reefs. And, and so I am very conscious, and I think my colleagues are extremely conscious as our activities reach the West Coast of how, what do we need to do? And we went to great lengths. By the way, the first design concept of, of KAUST was to build it on the reef island. There was going to be a lot of dredging, and KAUST was going to be miles into the water. And we, at the expense of you know, losing land and delaying the project, we shifted it inland, and we preserved all of these beautiful islands that you see and the reefs that you see when you go uh, into the water here in, 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 uh, in the Red Sea. We, and and we, we are planting mangroves here and in Yambu and elsewhere we work. Now we're going to be doing a lot of exploration. Uh, we've already started drilling in, uh, in the northern, by the, by the Bay of Aqaba, in the northern uh, Red Sea. And I can assure you that when, when we do our seismic, we're extremely conscious of protecting uh, the marine life when we choose a well location that is optimum from a geologic standpoint we send our environmental engineers to confirm that that's the best location and if it's not we shift the spud location where we drill the wells off the preferred location to make sure that we uh, we, we, we protect uh, the, the seabed where it needs to be protected. So we're very conscious of this. I think it's a great opportunity for us to work together with uh, with uh, with KAUST and with uh, with the Seymour Center that you're building here to integrate our activities together and to do long-term research. We have done this over the last 40 years or so with the King Fahd University of Petroleum and Minerals. Uh, on, on the Gulf side, and I think we will be doing it, I'm sure we will be doing it, here in the Red Sea uh, as we, our activities expand from exploration to developing the Jazan area, growth in Rabal, just north of here, and in Yambo, and, and elsewhere, the opportunities are great. David. Yes, thank you uh, for the warmth of your appreciation and for your assessment of this work in progress. As we look at what Aramco can do in a, in a very short amount of time, I think we're all very excited uh, by your uh, statement about the eight new international research centers, one of which, of course, we expect to host here. And I, was, I would love to hear more about uh, the scope of these in terms of the number of uh, PhDs and masters that will be employed, the themes that will be uh, undertaken, and whether they'll be thematically differentiated from site to site. And also for a company that's been 80 years consolidated around one location, what organizational strategies you have for making sure that these centers remain integrated with you know, the, the central themes. And many universities are facing you know, this satellite uh, concept for the first time as well. So maybe that's uh, an aspect that we can uh, learn from together. Well, thank you, uh, David. And, and I have to say uh, that I, I will be uh, not truthful if I gave you a precise answer to this uh, set of questions. And if we wanted to know the exact way that these centers would operate five years from now, we would have never built it. So I have to admit, first of all, that we're in a journey of discovery. We brought a uh, chief technology officer. We obviously, they are thematically centered. So one in Detroit, for example, and you may ask me, why did you choose to put a Everybody is running away from Detroit. The city is bankrupt. Why do you go to Detroit? We wanted a place close to the auto industry because the one in Detroit is going to focus not only on bringing together engine design and fuel formulations together, which we will back integrate into how do we build refineries in the future? How do we do it so that we have a combination of lowest cost, you will deliver to consumer, but have also the highest uh, mileage, uh, providing the cheapest mobility so that we can get the nine people that we're talking about moving from location to location using the finite, uh, precious uh, oil resources we have. So 
That gives you one example. The one in Houston, you don't have to guess. It's going to be working with the energy uh, services industry, and it's going to be focusing a lot on um, geophysics. It will also work on geology. We'll try to bring some of the unconventional uh, and shale technologies and adapting them to our own geology here, so it's going to be more incremental. The one in Detroit, by the way, is also going to work on carbon capture and mobile sources. So, and we have a prototype. This is something I didn't mention. But one thing we've done in Aramco is we already have a prototype vehicle that captures uh, some of the carbon emitted from the exhaust of a car using some of the heat energy in the exhaust to compress it and keep it contained with the idea that in the long term, if there is an economic use for the CO2, you can exchange it with the fuel in a fuel station. And that takes me to one of the other centers. We started this with KAIST, with one of your trustees here, Professor Nam So, who was convinced that we can turn CO2 into a useful product, either a fuel or a polymer or, or uh, so, he wanted to do something at KAIST. We had also started doing work along those lines. So we created a center in Korea, bringing some of their scientists with some of our own looking at carbon uh, conversion. The one in Beijing will be in geophysics, mathematical modeling. Some of our Chinese scientists just are convinced that, that there, there is uh, enough breadth and depth in China in this area. So we're opening a center. Five years from now, we may close some of these. And we may open uh, many others. The one here at Kaos will also be working with some of the areas. Obviously, the Red Sea, marine science, environmental, is going to be one of the themes. I believe uh, uh, combustion will be another one. Catalysis with Professor Fasse will be uh, another area that we want to work very closely, but they need to be flexible. The one here definitely needs, we will never close the one at Kaos. We may close the one in, in Beijing or Detroit, but the one here is, is permanent. So as the team came and saw us six months ago, we asked them to rent space in the innovation cluster and to get going, and I believe we have about 15 to 20 people working already here, temporarily until we build our own. But we advise them to have a flexible concept so that as cost strengths and our own needs evolve with time, that we can shift uh, from one focus area to another. But we certainly want to learn from you know, your ideas. I think we had a team led by Jim Calvin and Nadmi only last week come and look at collaboration. We have a steering committee with Professor John Lu Shamu leading it on your side that is looking at how can Saudi Aramco and Kaos collaborate, build on each other's strengths, and create synergies, because I am a believer that one plus one is more than two. So hopefully with that close interaction and realizing that there is a lot we don't know, that we're going to be discovering, rather than insisting that we have to design the final solution before embarking on an initiative, uh, is the spirit of our work in the area of innovation and technology, and certainly that goes into building these eight centers. Well, I, I, I've made a promise due to a scheduling conflict that we would, that we would try to end this uh, event uh, approximately now, but I have one last question as an executive privilege. <laughs> Is the football stadium in Jeddah done? I thought you were going to ask about the football stadium in Texas A&M. This is what <laughs> I, I, know that one's, I know that one's not done. Yes, it's done, and we're ready, uh, we're ready for uh, the proper authorities within the government to call for uh, the inauguration ceremony, so we will make sure that we provide enough tickets <laughs> for the inauguration event for KAUST, and we will provide buses to bring you to Jeddah. <laughs> it's, it's, go it's going to be a big party, I assure you of this. It's well, that's tremendous. Bill would like to give you a small token of appreciation for your, uh, your attendance today, your, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Oh. <laughs> I talked about Maryam, the astrologer. There was, there was a lady behind this. Okay. I think maybe you should, uh, you should hold it with me. Thank you all for attending tonight's uh, event. I look forward to seeing you at many future events for the next couple of Thank weeks. You, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.